Hello, my name is Lacey Davis. I'm working with Dr. Sarah Ledford in the Department of Geosciences at Georgia State University. And I'll be talking today about examining a mycofiltration efficacy in a first order stream. So I would like to begin by defining what is mycofiltration. Simply put, it is a technique that uses fungi to remove a range of contaminants from water. My research specifically focuses on the removal of E. coli bacterial contamination with the use of Tremetes versicolor fungal mycelium. So this picture here shows Tremetes versicolor mushrooms, and mushrooms are what people usually think of when they think of fungi, um, but those are actually just the fruiting body of fungi, and mycelium are the rooting body of fungi, and that's what we'll primarily use. Uh, when talking about mycofiltration. Now, bioremediation is really an umbrella term that uh, refers to using a variety of microorganisms uh, to remove contaminants out of soil or water. Whereas mycoremediation specifically refers to the use of fungi for removal of contaminants from soil. And then lastly, as I just described, mycofiltration is really concerned with the removal of contaminants by fungi through water or in water. Because this is a new field of research, evidence is limited uh, regarding bacterial contamination specifically. However, there's a fair amount of research regarding uh, the use of mycelium to remove chemical pollutants. Um, so various mushroom species and genera have shown uh, the ability to sequester high concentrations of numerous heavy metals um, in their mycelium as well as their fruiting bodies. They've also shown the ability to degrade heavy metals, hydrocarbons, and other chem chemical pollutants uh, such as pesticides like DDT as well as PCPs. Termini's versicolor in particular has shown the ability to degrade agrochemicals, um, and certain micropollutants. Micropollutants are typically not uh, able to be removed from wastewater treatment plants uh, through current operation practices. And they can range from pharmaceutical um, compounds such as antibiotics, um, psychiatric drugs, and endocrine disruptors. While there is some research regarding mycofiltration for bacterial contamination, um, like I said before, it's limited. So Paul Stamets has done a significant amount of research in this field. Um, his book, Mycelium Running, documents some of that research. He did some field experiments with agricultural runoff um, showing E. coli reduction as well as some lab experiments with Strophoria mycelium, which showed up to 20% E. coli reduction in the lab, uh, in the water column. Trad Cotter also has done mycofiltration research in his lab. And more recently, uh, Penne and Ged's 2020 research has shown E. coli removal rates um, after about 72 to 96 hour durations. However, all of this research um, has involved mostly some kind of shaker table um, where the mycelium and the contaminants are in constant contact. So in contrast um, with my research, my lab research, as well as field uh, research, hydraulic flow needs to be considered. So my work was primarily motivated from the work that the South River Watershed Alliance has been doing for years. Uh, regarding water quality in their watershed. Um, the mycofiltration lab research that I'll detail in a minute um, was designed as a prototype for mycofiltration installation in the South River, um, in Ripple Water Creek specifically. So the South River begins in Southwest Atlanta at what is commonly referred to as the Tift site. And then it flows in a Southeastern direction draining into the Altamaha River and then ultimately the Atlantic Ocean. Um, in 2019, the South River Watershed Alliance, including myself, um, identified eight locations, on the four on the main stem of the river and then four tributaries 
um, for water quality monitoring, specifically looking at total chloroform and E. coli distribution and concentrations. And so we began that program in July of 2019 and ran it through March 2020 <clears throat> when we were stopped from uh, continuing the work due to the pandemic. So on the next slide, I'll show you the data that we collected in terms of E. coli distribution along the South River. But I first want to acknowledge uh, the history of uh, water quality contamination along the river. So the bottom image here is uh, a picture of the Tift site, the headwaters of the river, and it's that milky blue white color uh, due to heavy metal contamination, specifically lead and copper, um, from a cotton manufacturing plant and then a fertilizer manufacturing plant that was near the headwaters. And although the remediation plan has been drafted for that, um, no remediation has begun as of this date. And then the top image here is a uh, picture of a sanitary sewer overflow, um, which is quite common in uh, along the South River, as well as combined sewer overflows and then E. coli contamination due to uh, stormwater runoff and then just leaking aging infrastructure. And although uh, DeKalb County uh, and the Department of Watershed Management has uh, been trying to mitigate these overflows and improve um, the infrastructure of the water processing plants um, and sewer infrastructure throughout the region. Um, unfortunately, sanitary sewer overflows are still quite common in DeKalb County. As of September 2020, uh, there were over 2 million sanitary sewer overflows. Uh, so this is still a really um, present problem in the South River. Okay, so this is the data that we collected at those eight locations um, along the South River uh, in terms of the E. coli concentration. So on the left y-axis, you can see uh, E. coli concentrations ranging from 0 to 10,000 MPM, most probable number, per 100 milliliters. And on the right y-axis, um, we have precipitation uh, in inches. Um, on the x-axis, those are the dates um, where samples were collected. And then each color here is showing a different sample site. So you can see that most sample sites um, had extremely high E. coli concentrations, even at base flow. Um, and Particular attention needs to be shown to the McDaniel site, um, CSO2, which is the sample site below the combined sanitary uh, overflow at Custer Avenue, and then Ripple Water Creek is quite high as well. Um, you can also notice in this graph um, the the horizontal line uh, that is the EPA, EPA E. coli limit for designated uh, swimming areas, and that is 235 MPMs. Um, so you can see that in the bottom there. Um, and it's clear that most of the sample sites, uh, most of the time they were sampled, are well above that EPA E. coli limit for recreational designation. Um, I need to note that the South River is not uh, designated as a as a recreational swimming uh, river. However, it is used that way uh, by community members and residents. Um, and it is still posing a public health risk because of that. OK, so now I'd like to talk about the lab portion of this research. A stream table was utilized to simulate a flowing stream. I collected sediment from Ripple Water Creek and sterilized it, um, and then placed it in the stream table. I then uh, ran a series of three experiments with a peristaltic pump, and the pump flowed at a constant rate of 5.2 milliliters per second. So the first experiment um, just pumped deionized water through the stream table and was used to determine a baseline concentration of E. coli after sterilization of the sediment. The second uh, experiment pumped E. coli uh, water 
through the stream table. Um, and the E. coli concentrations were an average of 615 MPMs per 100 milliliter. And in the third experiment ran E. coli contaminated water through the stream table and also through a uh, mycofilter filled with Trimedes versicolor uh, fungal mycelium. So throughout um, each of these experiments, um, samples were collected at, at the end of the stream table um, at every hour for five hours, and then they were run through an EPA um, certified IDEX system. So the E. coli that was used for each experiment was initially collected from a sample of water from Ripple Water Creek, and then that E. coli was isolated and then grown out um, at Georgia State's School of Public Health, and it was stored at negative 25 degrees Celsius until needed for the experiment. So in the image on the right here, you can see the mycofilter installed in the stream table. And that design is based off of Paul Stamen's mycofilter design. Uh, the filter itself is composed of a one to two ratio of Quercus alba white oak sawdust and Trimedes versicolor mycelium. So on the left here, you can see the white oak sawdust, um, which I sterilized and the Trimedes versicolor is in the middle and it's naturally that white color. So those two were combined in the mycofilter at a one to two ratio and then incubated for two to five weeks at 75 degrees Fahrenheit before installation. All right, so what did we find? Uh, this is two of the three experiments shown here uh, without E. coli and with E. coli. And on the y-axis, you'll see concentrations of E. coli in MPMs. And then on the x-axis, you will see hours, uh, the duration of the experiment. Each color here is going to represent a different experiment. So on the left graph, you'll see low concentrations of E. coli throughout. Um, that's because we sterilized the sediment. Um, and so this just determines baseline concentrations of E. coli for the remaining two experiments. Uh, and then the second graph here with E. coli, um, if you look on the X, on the Y axis, you'll see the square colors, and those represent the E. coli laced inputs uh, running through the sediment. And this is the third graph showing the final experiment uh, using the turkey tail or Trimese versicolor mycelium mycofilter. So after analyzing this data, um, the research suggests 4.49% uh, removal after mycelium deployment. Um, so it did show some removal, but not significantly or statistically different um, from removal of tests without mycelium. So even though these results are discouraging, they don't negate the potential for microfiltration efforts uh, in longer term projects, but only suggest the limitations of microfiltration for rapid response solutions uh, to bacterial contamination in surface water. So these preliminary findings um, suggest that the usefulness for microfiltration may be limited uh, by decreased contact time um, or hyperetic flow paths that bypass the mycelium installation or mycofilter. So the findings of the study are that Trimedes versicolor mycelium uh, mycofilter did reduce concentrations of E. coli with temporal variance uh, throughout the experiment, but overall statistically significant results uh, did not indicate a substantial removal of E. coli from the water column. So according to this research, more laboratory research is needed uh, to determine the effectiveness of Trimedes versicolor mycelium, as well as to, to determine uh, contact time limitations. So future considerations, such as the potential effects of increasing the burlap barrier width um, or including multiple burlap barriers along the stream table should be considered, as well as the potential use of a different species of fungal spawn for future research. 
So as noted before, mycofiltration for bacterial contamination is a new area of study, um, but has pro proven effective for heavy metal um, and chemical remediation in soils. So it's still possible that the usefulness of this technique, uh, once refined, could be helpful at mitigating high bacterial concentrations in small urban small order urban streams, uh, resulting from sanitary sewer overflows, combined sewer overflows, or contamination due to stormwater runoff. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to hearing some questions.